ballsy thinking, the gender agnostic antidote to sloppy thinking. Immigration, immigration, immigration. A topic which for 40 years has plagued British politics from the National Front to the English Defence League to the BNP. The issue has never really properly been given light. We must come from the darkness to the light. That process started, in my view, in 2014, when one man helped to make the topic of immigration safe for discussion in British politics. I know, because I was there. Yes, that's right, I was there. I was the head of communications for UKIP migration spokesman, more about that later, during the European, in the European Parliament from 2014, 2016. And uh, I saw what went on within UKIP and indeed within the national media as we managed to get this topic of immigration uh, and the flows around uh, who comes in not only to the UK, but at that time into Europe, onto the political agenda, which uh, I believe personally, and I think uh, generally a lot of the pollsters will tell you, uh, immigration turned out to be a politically politically important factor in the um, coming referendum. So with me today, I've got the man who I call Migration Man. I worked for him as head of communications um, uh, in his office uh, in um, Strasbourg and indeed in Brussels. Uh, flitting between him, his office in Chester, where he was MP for the northwest of England, which is just up by Chester, for those of you who uh, haven't quite got the geography of the UK. Uh, it's Stephen Wolfe. Hello. How uh, are you, Gary? Nice good to see you good. again. <laughs> good to see you. So I've got this sort of uh, selfie stick, which we'll just pull down and um, get it so that we can um, totally um, focus on what you're going to say, because I've called this Migration Man. Yeah. And... Uh, the reason for that is I believe that you uh, were the one person who um, managed to make it safe for us to talk about uh, immigration into the UK and indeed uh, in, in throughout Europe. Um, one of the few politicians, um, you um, managed to discuss it in a way which, of course, you got called racist and you can come on to that, but uh, it, it really you focused on the facts about immigration let's face it we were all helped by uh, mrs merkel and her, her incredible and extraordinary decision i think the phrase that we created was the merkel's monumental madness that's right in opening the doors exactly to the, uh, for the western europe to all of those whoever they may be from whichever country it was in the world and they took in a, a million and a half and it was madness it was madness Certainly and madness. indeed and i think she's apologized for that and seen it to be the case yes and it's you having know. huge effects now on the economy well totally yes absolutely but let's let's start at the beginning so i i uh, was contracted by you uh to be your head of communications yes. and very early on we had this sort of a uh, global trading global britain slogan yes um you know, which we put up and it had different currencies and people can see that on the screen. But the... Um, a of a pizza somewhere just outside of London, wasn't it? That's myself, right. Myself yeah, we, we sort of knocked up. We thought of about that. Thinking about it, yeah. yeah, and this was, this was 2014, July. And it was... Um, it, it, that really set the whole tone because we were never sort of mini Little Englanders or protectionists no. at all. And of course, it was really something which was obviously adopted later on by the Prime Minister and so on, where he called Global Britain and all the rest of it. Um, but what was your, you know, tell us a little bit about your how you became an MEP. All oh, right, well, the, the, the funniest story is when actually I was um, sat in front of, I think it was Spooks on a Sunday night, um, watching that programme, which I really enjoyed, as most people did, just relaxing when I got a telephone call. And the telephone call came from... Uh, Nigel Farage. And right. He said hello. Is that Stephen Wolf? And I said uh, yes. He said this is Nigel Farage. And I thought at the time it was my brother making fun, putting voices on and taking the Mickey. And uh, and I said who? I said uh, and, and then he went yes, it's Nigel Farage. And uh, then I realised who he was. And he asked me if I would come and meet. And from that meeting led to would I potentially speak at the 2010 Torquay conference. Now I can't remember whether that was a the national conference or their spring conference uh, at the time. So I agreed to go down, but not until I'd actually had a lunch with my family, and this is really relevant to where we are. I'm mixed race, as you know, black, Jewish, Irish, English. My family have got people who are different shades of all the colors that we've got and different backgrounds. So over this kind of Sunday lunch, we discussed whether I should go down and do this speech or not. And I remember most of the family saying, look, you've got to understand that a lot of the press 
really don't understand the publicans at all. They want to have a story. They'll uh, be really aggressive towards uh, new people, new parties. Because at that time, everyone was saying UKIP was uh, BNP in That's smart right. shoot, suits. So the BNP, for those who don't know, were the British, British National Party. Yeah, the British National Party that yeah. came out of the National Front. So the yes. implication was that they were simply the next racist uh, party. And so with the background that I had, it was really quite concerning whether I wanted to put my family through in. Actually, they were all very clear. They said, look, go down there, meet the people, say anything, and you don't have to join. And get involved in it anymore and I went down to that conference and what I realized when I got there that it was full of people from different races different backgrounds different nationalities and it was really interesting and certainly there was not a hint of racism some ex eccentric exactly there, yeah. which was yeah. absolutely superb in the old way that people used to fill their gardens with gnomes these yes. people were wearing different and some of those and were of, of absolutely eth ethnic, ethnic oh, absolutely. people as well weren't they? You know, they were the most interesting characters yeah, I was thinking of Winston from, and people like that yeah, you know. from different BAME backgrounds <laughs> yes. and, it, and, it, and I thought it was a real great me melting pot and so I got involved with the party and, and, it, and it just went on so I just started like everybody else joining campaigning delivering leaflets getting involved and of course that led to me getting inv into the campaign to be selected as a member of the European Parliament. Yes. And from there in 2014, I was elected as a member of the European Parliament. And in the meantime, I'd stood at a general election, stood in the London Assemblies, and stood in the Police and Crimes Commission yes. election, all for UK. Yes, that's uh, I, I remember it vividly. So we sort of met in 2014 once you were elected. That's correct. In a London yeah. pub, as you correctly say. Yeah. And uh, you you asked me to help you with the sort of the press and the publicity and sort of crafting the message. Yeah. And um, I think uh, we all thought uh, early on, when you say all, well, us and the team that you created, very good team, um, uh, that, you know, obviously migration was going to become... Uh, an important issue, even more so in, after 2015 when Cameron called the referendum. Uh, yes, but I mean, running up to that, we obviously had been nominated and selected as the spokesperson for the City of London, um, an economic spokesman. Yes, that's UK. right. And yes. When we got elected, that didn't last very long because Nigel wanted to put uh, another MEP, Patrick O'Flynn, into that particular role. He's the former political editor of the Daily Express. Yeah, so whilst that was going on, we were obviously looking at the issues of immigration. And we did th one thing, you and I, I mean, we'd noticed two things happening. One, the huge surge of uh, migrants coming across, obviously, from the war in Syria, but actually huge numbers coming up from Libya and Africa, yes. Ethiopia. Uh, uh, Ethiopia, from Somalia, yes. all coming up onto the boats of Libya and crossing in. And when we were there in the European Parliament, we were going across on the on the, the ferries or the Eurostar and we were driving up. We, we were noticing huge numbers totally. of people on yes. the side of the roads in camps. And it hadn't yet been reported massively. People had started talking about it. Uh, and then we heard that the British government had decided to help fund I can't recall off the top of my head now, you might, we might have to do some research on what it was, but I think it was about 30 million to help establish a new camp in Cali. Now, they'd got rid of one called Sangat, so yes. now we're looking at a couple of years later, having got rid of one, the UK government are now funding the French sure. to fund another camp. Yes. Well, we know that they keep funding the French on these. Bef and Before we get that down there, I wanted to, because I remember vividly we'd, we'd meet with Nigel and other people or... Uh, for, for when the uh, in London um, um, at the former Conservative Party HQ, which always tickled my fancy, because yeah. that was Europe House or whatever it was. Yes, that's Europe House, and it, um, and it became the headquarters of the European Be Commission. Exactly, and we had London. a room. Where we, we could had rent a room to. upstairs. Yeah, yes, we and uh, so we were there, and we would wait for the immigration figures to come out, or uh, the un you know see see what numbers they were, and they just inexorably just went up. The whole time. Oh yes, the net, net migration figures yes. were huge, and we we would actually do research on those numbers at the time. But they were all coming out from central uh, office at that time. It was really being run by Nigel's team because I hadn't been uh, elected, selected, appointed. Or, yeah. or appointed as the uh, spokesman on that subject at that yes. time, and that didn't happen till I think in the middle of uh, July. Or was it? No, actually, I think it was the September. Yes. Uh, 2014. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, and of course, those figures, one of the things that you always pointed out 
to the mass media uh, who started to interview you regularly and we'll come on to that and uh, people will see on the screen certain throughout this talk certain bits where you were, where were being interviewed uh, on it we'll, we'll go into some depth on on that but uh, you know about the national insurance numbers yes. you know because that to me was a key thing you yeah know. i mean Do you want to explain that well yeah we, we we'd seen these massive upticks in net migration and people say well, what is net migration so the first thing is almost an educational process we're trying to say the numbers of people that come to the uk to work to study come as family reunion visits and there was a little ad hoc uh, numbers those are the people that would come into the country and those people were leaving which included uh, foreigners holiday makers uh, students going back uh, you took one from the other and you'd come up with a number of how many people had actually ended up staying yes in in the uk and we were regularly getting 150 160 170 thousand a year a year yes so we're yes. getting the equivalents of small villages and small towns but in the research that we did we yeah. had a look at how many people were being employed. Because when you get a, a job, you are given a national insurance number. That's right. And one um, time, I think it was very clear, we'd come out and said, well, hang on, the national insurance numbers are saying that we've got nearly a million new national insurance numbers last year. And yet the net migration figures uh, were 225,000. The numbers of people who were coming in for work was not a million. No. So the, there was a huge mismatch. Yes. And just around the same time, an opponent of ours on the immigration uh, debate, um, Jonathan. Jonathan Portis, yes. who was the yeah. original person working in the Gordon Brown government that said only six to 10,000. That's right. Um, kind of po Polish nice enough people chap, were coming. But very wrong. Uh, nice <laughs> enough to chap. <laughs> he, he also came out and actually agreed with with our, our, our numbers and said it's probably about the only time he's ever agreed. Yes, he was. He was so it, for, he would have done it for different reasons. But there was a clear mismatch, and then we started the debate that there was a lot more people coming into the UK and staying here and getting jobs and working than the, the, the ways of recording official people coming in. And of course, we were the ones who highlighted how people were recorded yes. into the UK. You mentioned your appointment. Can we just go over that? Because I remember it was in Strasbourg. Yes, and, it was. And, uh, you and I had talked beforehand, hadn't we? Because we, we had an inkling of what Nigel... Because Nigel never really had for his spokespeople or whatever. He it, he wasn't a one-man band necessarily. And, of course, he was right to... His, one of the great figures of the first part of this century, uh, first 20 years, as a politician in the UK. But he really didn't have regular meetings with his spokespeople because, you know, it wasn't a shadow cabinet or anything. Um, but uh, I remember us talking in the office before we went up and I said to you, you got, can't be called immigration. You know? uh, um, tell us about that, that moment that you, you got that portfolio because that was brilliant. That he, yeah. Good choice on his part, by the way. No, no, it was interesting. We, we'd gone to Strasbourg, which is probably only our third visit to, yes, that's right, yeah. to, to, to Strasbourg. And Strasbourg is where all the political votes are made and all the big parties come together for four days as a massive bum fest really a huge waste of money but it did mean that for once you'd get all the political parties and the MEPs all literally together in, for, uh, in that one place for that four days and that meant that Nigel did a lot of his politicking and decision making uh, at that time and yes you're right he he'd had spokesmen uh, uh, for different issues in the previous uh, Parliament but I think he wanted to try and expand it out there was a lot more of us we'd become the biggest party uh, in, in, in Britain in, in elected and one of the biggest part group parties in the whole of the European Parliament for a political party so he did want to start having speeches and groups who were going to be spokesperson for different areas so we would had that initial conversation between ourselves we decided and I think it's after I read a Cambridge professor's book uh, about the impacts of exactly. immigration yes. on the countries where these people left. Absolutely. How impoverished areas. They were, how yes. Nurses and doctors being taken away from our, uh, uh, from their countries and taken into our NHS after they've been trained up there and leaving them bankrupt of people med for medical care in those countries. And, and what someone from the Nigerian uh, um, embassy had called a new form of economic colonialism. So that made me think more broadly about the issues, about what's the impact on those countries as well as the impact on our own country and the flows coming through. And migration is the word for that. It yes, included exactly. genuine workers, Absolutely. genuine stu students, 
but also legal, and it covered the whole numbers. And at that time, you had a Labour Party that had an immigration spokesman. You had a Conservative member of the Cabinet that was called, you know, an immigration uh, uh, spokesman. And, and Nigel, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the immigration minister. And, and Nigel called me in and said, well, it's, and it was him, and there was Tim Aker, who was another MEP, there was Patrick O'Flynn, and I think, I can't recall who the fourth MEP was at that time. And they sat around this table, we had for lunch, and Nigel wanted to discuss how um, he would take the portfolio of economics from me and give it to Patrick. Which, you know, obviously we'd started doing a lot of work on it, but not, not a great deal. As you said, Global Britain was our yes. line, and it was then taken by the Conservative Party. I think that was really quite a proud moment for us. I yes, think. it was. Really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a Global Britain used thereafter. And, and then he said, Stephen, I, Stephen, I would like you to become the, the um, immigration spokesman. Um, my response to that was no. And the table went silent. <laughs> they never expected yes. that response. And I said, no, uh, if we're going to go to it, we've got to modernise our message and modernise our language. Excellent. And we, I will be the migration spokesman. And there was a little bit of kerfuffle from the two MEPs there. Nigel was thinking about it and then asked me a little bit more. And then I tried to explain about the differences and how we could not only talk about immigration, but we can talk about the uh, cost of living and housing in yes, the UK. Yes, absolutely. But we could also talk about foreign aid and, and redirecting foreign aid. So for other parts of our portfolios and other spokespeople, we'd have a broader attack and, and we would be removing the language. And I remember one other thing that I said to him very clearly that day, that if I'm beyond uh, the, the person who's going to be involved in pushing this message, not only must I be able to craft the policy, but I also have to craft some of the language and the message and deal with solely the real importance about the numbers and the figures and statistics and give proper evidence to everything. And its come effect back. on Britain. And then it's the effect on ourselves, but also the impact on those, the others. So we were much broader. Yes. Uh, and after so, much to and fro and there was questioning about it, and then there was a little bit of pushback uh, about it, um, and they could see that I was quite determined I, that the I, message my, was going. On my recollection, you came back from that meeting because I was sitting, I, I think I sat at your desk at the time waiting for you. You came back into the office and you said, you know, I was, I was looking at you thinking, you know, what have you got, first of all? And you said, I've got, you know, I've got the, the, the migration portfolio, for want of a better word. And I said, you know, with the term migration. And you, you said, yes, yeah, they've accepted that, although there was pushback because I think Nigel at the time didn't think that migration would cut through to That's the public. Right. He didn't. You know, he it, didn't it, think it immigration, would. obviously, everyone can understand. But, I, OK, I don't think we can claim in 2014 to have seen the Merkel madness. But <laughs> no, no. <I laughs> yes, mean, we that, did. That, that was, yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, we, we were obviously looking at that. But, yeah, you but know, it, was, it was generally something that really helped us after it, that. It really did. And, OK, so there's, there's so many different things I, I, you know, I could bring up. Uh, I want to bring up just a couple, which I think really... Because the purpose of this video to me is calling it Migration Man, is that, and as I said, you wouldn't have seen me do the intro, but I said, you know, I think you really did help put a discussion of immigration on the political map in a safe way. Because before that, as you say, we had, uh, you know, we had English Defence League, we had National Front, and it, this went on for 30, 40 years. Yeah, and absolutely. of course, the term racist was thrown around and it was even thrown around at you. Okay. You know, and you were yeah. called a, a, what was it, a coconut? A and coconut, an Oreo, you know, I mean, I'm, we had the, a huge event in uh, London with all the um, black, Asian, Chinese, Indian, huge numbers of candidates from different ethnic backgrounds. From UK. Backgrounds, from UK yeah, yeah, absolutely. We had, a, we had more uh, candidates in the 2015 uh, general election who were of a different nationality and culture and background, you know, than any of the other political parties added together apart from the Labour Party, you know, and it was really, really dynamic and exciting. Yes, yes. And being there, you had uh, Pauline McQueen, beautiful uh, lady who'd come from Jamaica and Jewish, being shouted down by white students from LSE and <laughs> from Hope Not Hay. Not surprising. All saying they were Hope from Not yeah. Hay, but they were obviously denied at the time by that organisation, um, calling her a, a racist. Yes. Uh, you had 
Uh, I think Amjad, who became an MEP, being called a racist, from, despite his Pakistani background. Winston Mackenzie and other pastors and preachers. Well, it's still going on today when you look at Femi, yeah. uh, who's standing for uh, or, or uh, yes. Biederman. So you've you know. got Swella, Swella Braverman, and you, you have all these other, and Pretty Patel, the way that Precisely. they've attacked her. So, you know, you're called somebody who is generally um, a racist or a, 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 what is the other thing that they call you? A traitor to your race and your colour yes. and your creed because you just don't believe in their Marxism and their division and their separation and their anger, really. Yes. And, and they really are angry, angry children. Yes. Who really haven't got out of their kindergartens and just want to smash people's heads in who dis disagree with them rather yes. than engage with the debate. And that's what we wanted to do at the time. Well, I think that's But we right. also needed to change the language well, and I change think... the tone. The tone was essential, Absolutely. and UKIP wasn't going down the right tone on this. We were going down the line, that we were falling into the trap, that it totally. was all about saying Poles and Romanians were, were criminals, rather than addressing the issue that there were decent Poles and decent Romanians, but there were Polish criminals In the majority and there were well. Romanian criminals. So you had to s separate who they were, and you had to deal with the issues. So when you talked about people coming across, talk precisely about how many from foreign countries were criminals and how many come over as illegal immigrants and how many who were coming here working did a great job. Yes. Because it's about humanity. It is. It was about us as people. And if you cut us, we all bleed. It doesn't matter what color you are, yeah. what creed you are, what race you are, we're all human beings. And so their language had to change. And, and I, I think we, we did a pretty good job about well, it. Well, I think, yes, yeah, not only the language, that's true and of course that's probably the most important thing really uh but in within that there was some real really good policy which you yeah. made as well which you led i mean there's a couple of incidents so uh, the one was the mark reckless interview he was standing for a by-election yes and he and said that, was, uh, that, that we were going to start important. deporting people that was who didn't you know who, uh, of, of, of europe european union citizens yeah. um, and i'll never forget uh we arranged we we got a call from Daily Politics with Andrew Neil, yes, and you went on, and that was your best interview ever. I <laughs> thought you. absolutely superb, where you dealt with that issue very calmly, and he was he was a tiger. You know, he kept going on, and you just simply said the guy's wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm the migration spokesman. That's not the policy, and yeah. you explained what it was. So, I think you know your presentation skills were superb, but also you had balls. <laughs> not only your balls, you think it, but you you have a big pair of cojones because we used to drive back from Strasbourg and we'd stop in at the camps you're one of the first MEPs that's right into that's the Calais right. camps and there's a video which is showing now in a box which shows you all amongst the migrants so you know what and you just leapt out the car I'll never forget there's a separate video on on the ballsy thinking site which shows it in more detail but you just thrust yourself into these people so what were they telling you well You've got got two. We, the, there was the first one, which was really your quite decisive decision on a bloody freezing Absolutely. night. Oh God, it was freezing night. The government had just I announced that so they're opening this that. new camp, as I mentioned in Calais. Yes, it right. was pouring down with rain. The wind was going. Calais was absolutely, absolutely freezing. I'm standing in the new migrant centre based in Calais, where. The European Union has decided to spend three million euros building a camp for those migrants who are coming across Europe and settling here. In this tent today there were 200 uh, people who are being fed and watered and over in the darkness they have a base where they'll be able to sit and eat. On the left hand side there is a tent where they will be able to have their mobile phones and other electronic communications uh, used. The debate had, had begun to develop. We started to see people being attacked on um, in their vans, uh, that people in caravans were being aggressively attacked by uh, the, the migrants who were trying to get across yes, that's right. into the UK by, trying to hide. By, by that time. And, you know, you had ridiculous things like hauliers being charged for people sneaking into their boats. So that became 2015. Then more people started coming across because of Mon Merkel's monumental madness. And by May of next, the following year, 2015, that camp that we talked about was full. Yes. And another dirty camp full yes. of tents and everything. And, and that's what you were talking about earlier. Yeah, we, about, we saw that. Yeah. You, you said then 
we got we spoke with the Daily Express, or rather, they called us up and they spoke with yourself, and we went, and that was it. And that's what the video that you're talking about is when I we turned up at the Cali camp, and I think you were stunned. You looked at it, yeah, and I, totally. And I, I was kind of the size of it by this time. It was just stretching a good half mile across the dirt camp, and I could see the faces of the Daily Express uh, journalist and the cameraman. And also the little bit of fear from them because there was just so many of these people. Yes. Uh, and that wasn't that wasn't the issue I got because we got to the top of this little mound. Didn't That's we? right. And you started taking some videos. Yes. And I just jumped in. Yeah, you jumped in, and and, and, I, I, and you completely you completely disappeared. Right, well, I'm I'm here with Stephen Wolf, MEP for the northwest of England, who's apparently the first UK politician to come and visit this new development here in now I arrived with Stephen in January today's the 11th of June and we visited the official camp which is up there now the, the, the local authorities have now allowed this camp to develop and I just stood up there and frankly it's it's astonishing to witness this in a, you know, a European country. This is the, the camp which is starting to be developed, mainly men. The women have their own camp further up the road. Somewhere in here is Stephen. And as typical, I can never can keep tabs of him. So he's, he's over there chatting away to these people from all over. I guess North Africa, wherever, um, and he's thrown himself with typical gusto into the fray, so to speak. Um, and <laughs> we've got a shortage of houses of shortage of houses in Britain, primarily because of, or good part because of um, immigration from the EU and elsewhere. And here, these guys just get practical and start making it up but you say there were so many of them but they were all young men oh yes to almost to a person yeah no, I, we didn't the, see any women no were no women no, um time. and that's when we also realized that they weren't just from syria because of oh. course the big merkel play was that they were all coming from syria that's right and they were coming right. from afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, they were coming from afghanistan a lot yes. a lot of africans yes uh, the vast majority of them and i remember the daily express people saying we shouldn't go in we shouldn't go in but I went in and, and I started kicking a football around with them. I remember I was doing some keepy uppies yes. with them and then suddenly I was surrounded yes. by uh, I think about a dozen of them. And we started asking them questions and, and, and I asked them about their journey. How did they get here? Why were they trying to get into Britain? And the clear answer to them was that they felt, they said that Germany was racist. They said that France was racist. But they wanted, France, yeah. they wanted to come to England because they could speak the language, that we would educate them, that we would teach them, that there was jobs there, uh, that uh, we would allow them uh, to, to live their lives. And for them, coming to Britain was the story they'd been told. It, this was a place where the streets were paved with gold for them in terms of everything they weren't getting at home. It was economic migrancy. Yes. This was nothing to Absolutely. do with about That's them the coming word. through. And yeah. whilst we were talking to them, the, the last thing we had was when we saw one person run towards them in the end. I remember that little guy. And he bustled into the internet and tried to shut everyone down. That's right. Uh, and yes, it also yes. became very clear that the, the minders watching what they said, and they had to say the right thing. Soon after that, almost everybody was saying that we were all being trafficked through torture and yes. you know, that they were... Uh, gay and being put persecuted in their countries. The language yeah, that, completely that's it. changed. They learned how to, to play and the there, system. And the, the final time we went, I think, was much later on that, that year. And by that time, there were tents from NGOs. Exactly. There were, the pop stars and film city. stars were coming along. Every Tom, Dick and Harry who wanted to be socially aware and given themselves as the social justice warriors had gone to the camps. And including our own MEPs who saw what we'd done then started to <coughs> go as well and to find other camps along the way and say that yes. they got shot at and yeah, yeah, things like well, that all trying yeah, to jump on the bandwagon yeah well all all to the all grist to the mill because it was all so much of it was true yeah you know it was just a complete shambles um 
Another shambles I remember was the Manifesto 2015, <laughs> where we yeah. busted a gut, we oh. looked One of the best costed, not just her, but her team and everything, was one of the best costed political manifestos I've ever seen. Mm. And I've been around, you know, doing this stuff for 40 years. Um, and uh, we, the migration bit was very important. There's a picture, uh, hopefully, uh, up now uh, on it. But as soon as, I never forget, of course, we never had any real meetings. Nigel didn't have that sort of thing. And he wasn't really involved in the detail of the manifesto. No, he wasn't no he details, delegated no. that eventually to Suzanne Evans, who did a pretty good job. But when it came to immigration and migration, the mm. section, we agreed everything. And then literally, as soon, within 12, you know, as soon as it was launched, within 12 hours, she was contradicting the numbers and saying that we weren't going to put limits in and everything. I mean, it was absolutely that's, that's right. I mean, we'd spent uh, a good six months. It was very clear. Nigel was never interested in detail. Yeah. He was never really interested in the spokespeople themselves. He was never really interested in their portfolios, perhaps other than a couple of quick messages that he could get off into the press, a couple of lines that could be used by the communications team. We were never called together as a group of spokespeople like other political parties would do to discuss them over a weekend, to have everybody else debate the ideas that were going into those manifestos. And that would have been a cohesive element to do. It would have brought the team together and it would have brought the message a little bit more tighter. And these things that w would have been a problem, which we discovered later, would have been ironed out then. Whilst we were on that process, it was very clear to us that we, we must have a number of restricting the number of people that were coming each year. 50,000 a year, I think, was, it was the number yeah, that, that we it. came. And we said, you know... That well, because net migration was over a quarter of a million. Yeah, so we had to reduce it. And we clearly set out how that could be achieved. Yes. And it could be achieved by simply stopping... Uh, unskilled migration yes and you would still once you offset the number of students that went out and came out when you offset those who were coming here on holiday and returning all of that would then lead us to a net migration figure which we could achievably reach as 50,000 and we'd agreed it off we had uh, no zoom meetings then but I think we had a Skype yes meeting. that's it that's cool. with, with, with Susan all technology uh, and we'd done that and the next thing we know we had Gwaine Towler on the phone saying he's a head of communications head of for communications UKIP, for UKIP saying, saying that well it's gone out that we're we're not doing net migration of 50,000 yeah and I'll so never you know, that. and so we now had the situation where we had people with a manifesto writing out saying we hadn't got uh, a, a number Nigel saying we not got a number and then suddenly they're saying there is a number because it's in the manifesto then it's been taken out and they absolutely destroyed the message. It was just a bodged operation. They bodged it up, up and so, whoever had got involved to try and scupper the idea of that 50,000, whoever had had to try and push Suzanne into to not allowing that, was behind the idea of trying to destroy one of the key policies. Yes. And from what I understand now, Susan had been approached by others in the party to remove it. And yes. it wasn't her initial intention to do so. No, okay. Right. So that's good because I've always blamed her, but you know. Well, that's that's that's. I mean, a she, lot of people did. Yeah, but she was amenable to it. She didn't want that number anyway. So right. when others suggested it, she oh, felt she had okay. the influence to be able to do it. But it did scupper us, and it, it, it became a problem because our message had been diluted immediately. Yes. Okay. Well, so we we now move really. Yeah, you had some other issues which I don't want to go into. Uh, with respect to your relationship with UKIP and indeed as an MEP. Uh, but um, what I wanted to just focus on was, uh, and the, the, my, my thesis really as, as a, for the ballsy thinking piece here is that, you know, because of that work that we did in 14, 15 and 16, with the luck of the, the um, Merkel migration, um, you know, what is your assessment of the role that the messenger, the immigration message played in the EU ref. Oh, the EU referendum was essentially won because of two basic arguments, freedom and immigration. And if we'd not been able to pursue three years of bringing the immigration numbers to the fore, talking about Absolutely. the numbers, not the people. Yes, if we hadn't, the numbers, not the people. If we hadn't softened uh, the kind of line to migration rather than immigration, or if we hadn't changed the tone, I would not have been allowed to do a speech at British Future that talked about the importance of having 
uh, people from different countries come to our nation and the beauty of our own BAME uh, communities integrating with ours but also being able to distinguish between those who are coming here for illegal migration. And the fact that we were able to have this global Britain idea where we could have a fair, flexible, forward-thinking migration policy, which became the policy document that I then produced post-Brexit for the Leave Me As Leave campaign, it was that continuation. And no one else had spoken about it. We had actually been deeply involved in, in the work done by, you know, uh, members of the team. But I won't mention the names in case they don't want to be mentioned anymore about it but we, we had good researchers working we on did. the background with two or three other people helping us and there was a really strong cohesive message and I think that enabled us to be able to say to this was not about opposing people it was actually about having a more flexible place for Britain to be able to work in a global Britain yes and we did that and I was very proud of it and I was so you very proud been. of the work that we were so you should have been no I, I think absolutely and so now today what are you you've got the Centre for Migration that you yes so after I left the European Parliament in 2019, I had a period of time away, um, obviously to, to reflect on where we were. And of course, Brexit had been won, and we saw the, the three years of the Remainers doing the campaign to neuter Brexit, stop it, make sure it didn't work. Uh, but the great thing about it, we, I did produce the paper for Leave Means Leave, which was published, I think, in late 2016. And that set an agenda, including them. Migration Advisory Council, which I'd supported with the idea of being able to assess visas per industry. Well, that industry. was in the bloody UKIP manifesto. Yes, but we'd extended it and we moved exactly, it along. Yes. So we've taken the debate along, which I say to about 17. So, and I kept on the message of immigration numbers. So then I f formed the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity uh, in the idea that what was needed is to have another voice out there alongside Migration Watch that produced in-depth research and numbers about what's happening to Britain and immigration on policy and the amounts of people coming here. Uh, obviously Covid stepped in the way and during Covid we were able to see that people started to move on the ch channel migrants, on the small boats coming across. Yes, absolutely. And so we've been at the forefront alongside Migration Watch in raising the issues of that. Um, we are, I'm doing big pieces on asylum at the moment and it looks to me that what we have is that for every individual that comes to this country it will cost us about 40,000 a year per person in the first year. Wow. We'll have 200,000 this year from those from the Ukraine, from Hong Kong, from the legal migrants and other programs that we've got which is a bill of about 8 billion. Now if you think about how many households that we have, 26 odd million, that's the equivalent of about £400 per household, which would go significantly to reducing the bills if we didn't have this mass migration, which would include pressure on housing, the schools, the dentistry, the hospitals, and, and, and eventually feed through to crime and benefits as well. So all of that, and we're raising that issue. It's tough because um, it's difficult to raise money in, in this environment. If you are a non-government organisation, if you're an immigration charity, if you get paid by the government through the Home Office. Sure. The Home Office is actually funding the organisations that are suing them to stop exactly. their Exactly. It's, it's ridiculous. Every single council in this country is spending at least one million on charities and organisations that are opposing the policies such as Rwanda. If we had one million, we'd be able to massively impact the message going out, even if we had a tenth of that. Yes, yeah, so they're don't. collectively financing it rather than individual yeah. individual councils so, are contributing to a pool. Yeah, my idea and ideal would be that I would have a team of um, about five people, not a very massive team because it's e easier to, for us to be able to work together nice as we tight. did when we were nice and tight exactly. and develop really strong messages that we can get to policy. But yesterday I spent a few days with few hours with different ME, MEPs and leaders, conservative leaderships. MPs, you mean? So MPs, <laughs> with, um, you know, it yeah. doesn't leave the name, does it, sometimes? Yeah. But I was talking to them about the importance of immigration as a message for conservative leaderships and the Red Wall and how they will lose those seats uh, for a generation if they don't discuss it. So I am pushing on. So the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity I think you're going to put the website on the bottom of there. Sure. If people want to contact me if they want to help financially, that'd be great. Or if they just want to, um, you know, discuss or let me know about the issues in there, I'm perfectly happy.
Great. Well, they say that, um, as I said at the beginning, um, there's a saying that uh, if economics is really easy to understand. In the short run, it's about incentives. And you can see that now when you have uh, people striking for extra money and so on. But in the long run, it's all about demographics. And as I said at the very beginning, um, in my view, and obviously I was at the heart of it, uh, some people say, well, you would say that, but I'm not being paid to say that. And of course, I can look back on my life and reflect on all sorts of things. But one of the things I do reflect on is how um, Stephen Wolf, um, the migration man, actually, and you've heard today how just a little bit of it, there's a lot more intricate stuff behind the scenes, how Stephen Wolf managed to put um, immigration um, as a topic up for sensible discussion, not only in the uh, general elections that we've had subsequent to 2014, but of course also during the EU referendum. And so, Stephen, you know, I'd like to say on behalf of the country, thank you. <laughs> I think you're the unsung hero. No, it's not generous at all. It's a fact. You know, the un unsung hero of UKIP's time in the European Parliament. Um, and we haven't even got to your role as financial spokesman either. No. That's got to be a separate one because, of course, you did a lot of work um, criticising the policy of Mario Draghi and the quantitative easing, which has got us all into so much poo. But uh, that's for another time. So for now, uh, the great ballsy thinker Stephen Wolf on migration. You, you heard it here. Thanks for listening to this Ballsy Brief, where we take a topic and try to apply unorthodox or common sense thinking to something which is a matter of public concern. If you've liked it, please give us a lick and subscribe.